Hello, hello, writers, and welcome to episode number 38 of the Well Storied podcast. If you're new to this show, first, hi, it is a pleasure to meet you. My name is Kristen Kiefer, and I run a website called Well Storied, where I help writers craft sensational novels and build their very best writing lives. The Well Storied podcast is where I translate the articles from my blog into audio, so you can listen in on the go. They are short, they are snappy, super informational, so if you don't have a lot of time on your hands but you're eager to improve your writing skills, you've come to the right place. In today's episode, we're diving back into our discussion on the three-act story structure. In our last episode, number 37, we discussed what the three-act story structure is, why the idea that structure is too rigid or makes for boring stories is a lie, and whether or not the three-act story structure in particular is right for you and your stories. We also broke down the first act of the three-act story structure, which includes major story beats such as the hook, the inciting incident, and the first plot point. So make sure to check out that episode before diving in today so you can cover all your bases and you're all prepped and ready to go. Now, are you ready to learn all about how to craft an incredible middle act for your story now that your protagonist has begun their journey? Let's dive into today's episodes, friends. If you'd like to read along as you listen, you can find the original article and transcript for today's episode at well-storied.com slash act two. The second act. Is the middle of your story dragging? Are you worried that your book isn't exciting enough to maintain readers' interests? Back in the day, I constantly struggled to write past the first few chapters of a manuscript. I knew who my protagonists were, what they wanted, and how their journeys would end, but how in the world did one fill in the gaps? I hadn't a clue, and because of that struggle, I quit on draft after unfinished draft, telling myself I just wasn't good enough to be a writer. Fortunately, that all changed when I discovered the power of story structure, specifically the three-act story structure. The second act of this popular storytelling blueprint makes plotting the dreaded middle section of your book a breeze, or at least a heck of a lot easier than it was before. How so? Let's discuss just that today. Let's begin with an overview of the second act. Understanding the structure of the second act is vital to understanding strong storytelling. If you don't know how to connect your story's introduction and resolution, you'll likely either bail on your unfinished manuscript or allow it to drag on forever as you work to connect unrelated, uninspired events to form a proper narrative. Both of these situations are obviously bad news. Fortunately, they can be avoided with a simple understanding of story structure. So let's break down the second act of the three-act story structure today, beginning with a quick overview. Act 2 picks up where Act 1 left off, and makes up the bulk of your book, running anywhere from the 15 to 25% mark of your story through the 75 to 90% mark of your story. The act itself can be broken down into two distinct sections, before and after your story's midpoint, which occurs, of course, at roughly the 50% mark of your book. If Act 1 was all about introduction, Act 2 is about opposition. As your protagonist journeys to achieve their story goal, they'll encounter a series of trials and tribulations that may include physical roadblocks, opposition from the antagonist or antagonistic force, tension with and among their friends or helpers, and inner conflict. But how your protagonist handles these trials and tribulations will depend on where they are in their journey. How so? Let's break down the nuances of Act 2 now, shall we? Beginning with the pre-midpoint reactionary hero. After accepting the call to adventure found in the first plot point of your story, which we discuss in episode number 37 on the first act, your protagonist has begun the journey toward achieving their story goal. But this journey is still quite new and overwhelming and their core flaw or fear, the one that made them hesitate to begin the journey in the first place, still weighs heavy. Such fragile confidence really doesn't leave much room for your protagonist to entertain conflict. Unfortunately, conflict is on the way. Someone or something poses a threat to your protagonist, and this antagonist or antagonistic force isn't about to let your protagonist achieve their goal without a fight. This throws your protagonist into survival mode. 
Instead of taking direct action against the antagonist, your protagonist focuses all of their energy on merely surviving the conflicts thrown their way, so they can get back to chasing down their story goal as soon as possible. This happens time and again throughout the pre-midpoint rising action. Yet despite all of these trials and tribulations, your protagonist fails to recognize the consequences of their reactionary state, of just how much they're putting at stake by refusing to take a stand. And that's going to come back to bite them. But first, check out these popular examples of pre-midpoint rising action. In The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins, Katniss trains to survive the games. After the games begin, she gathers supplies and runs for her life, facing many physical dangers, but not really doing anything to harm any of the other tributes, before being discovered and hunted by a fearsome group of tributes known as the Careers. In Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, Elizabeth refuses a marriage proposal from Mr. Collins and grows complacent after Mr. Wickham, a beloved new acquaintance, leaves town with his regiment. She then decides to visit her friend Charlotte and unexpectedly runs into Mr. Darcy, whom she has sworn to loathe for all of time. In The Faulkner Stars by John Green, Augustus reveals that he worked with a cancer charity group to, find, to fund Hazel's trip to Amsterdam. A visit to the ICU nearly prevents Hazel from going on the trip, but she is at last deemed well enough to travel and her overseas journey begins. Now let's move on to exploring the game-changing midpoint. What will finally push your protagonist to engage with the core conflict of the story? The answer is simple. Raised stakes. And those raised stakes will become apparent in a game-changing conflict between your protagonist and antagonist known as your story's midpoint. As the name suggests, the midpoint takes place at roughly the 50% mark of your book and represents the biggest conflict yet between the protagonist and antagonist or antagonistic force if you don't have a direct villain. It's during this conflict that the protagonist will come to realize the true dangers of the antagonist's actions or intent, often as a result of their own failure. And just like that, your protagonist experiences an, an integral shift. No longer can or will they ignore the threat the antagonist poses. They become actionary, ready to do anything within their power to subvert the antagonist's will. Even if, in some cases, that means sacrificing the likelihood of achieving their goal. Ready to see the midpoint in action? Check out these popular examples next. In The Hunger Games, Katniss, having been hunted and trapped by her fellow career tributes, takes violent action to escape, an event that convinces her at last to stop running and start fighting to win the games. In Pride and Prejudice, the conflict between Elizabeth and Darcy comes to a head when Darcy confesses his love and proposes marriage. An argument ensues when Elizabeth refuses him, and later that night, Darcy gives Elizabeth a letter that challenges everything she believes she knew about him. And in The Fault in Our Stars, Hazel and Gus arrive in Amsterdam, only to discover that her favorite author, who they were going to visit, is actually a miserable drunk who refuses to answer Hazel's, any of Hazel's questions. Hazel, distressed and angry, decides to live for what happiness she can get, and finally admits her love for Gus. And now let's talk about the second half of our Act 2, and that is the post-midpoint rising action. Thanks to the events of your story's midpoint, the protagonist shifts from reacting to conflict to actively pursuing it knowing that directly opposing the antagonist or antagonistic force is the only way to protect themselves and others from harm. And thus, the post-midpoint rising action has arrived. Now that your protagonist actively seeks out conflict, the pace of your story will pick up, turning ever more quickly toward the final climactic sequence. During this time, several significant instances of conflict should occur, each continuing to strengthen your protagonist's newfound confidence and resolve. But despite all of this progress, a devastating loss looms just over the horizon, one that will threaten to derail your protagonist's entire journey. But more on that in an upcoming breakdown of Act 3. First, let's take a look at these popular examples of post-midpoint rising action. In The Hunger Games, Katniss works with Rue to destroy the tribute's supply cache, and actually kills a tribute in an effort to protect Rue. She later tracks down Peeta, 
fights another tribute for medicine that will heal Peter's injured leg and makes sacrifices to keep them both alive. In Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth must challenge her opinion of Mr. Darcy after reading his letter and learning more about his true nature upon visiting his home. Meanwhile, Darcy makes a concerted effort to right his wrongs by helping Elizabeth's family weather her sister's scandalous marriage. And in The Fault in Our Stars, Hazel and Gus begin dating in Amsterdam before he confesses to her that his cancer has returned. Gus's condition worsens significantly after they return to America. Hazel reclaims her love for her favorite book by using one of its quotes to show Gus that, no matter what happens, she doesn't regret their time together. And now, let's talk about wrapping up the second act. Throughout Act 2, your protagonist has journeyed to achieve their goal, they have grown dramatically as a character, and faced extensive conflict at the hands of an antagonist or antagonistic force. But despite all of this growth and change, there's one element of your protagonist's life that they've continued to suppress. Their core flaw or fear. That's all going to change as we launch into Act 3 with the antagonist dealing one final and unexpected blow that forces your protagonist to face this flaw or fear head-on, or give up all hope of defeating the antagonist and achieving their dream. Ready to dive in? I will have the next episode of our breakdown on the three-act story structure available for you soon. That will be episode number 39, so keep an eye out. It should be around in just a couple of days, writers. Don't you just love the power of story structure? One of my favorite things about Act 2 of the three-act story structure is how it takes that amorphous mess that is the middle of your story and gives you concrete story beats you can use to map out both your story's plot and character arcs with ease. Act 3, however, includes one of my favorite moments in good storytelling, like, of all time, <laughs> and that is the Dark Night of the Soul. I cannot wait to discuss this moment with you guys, as well as your story's climactic sequence and resolution, which we'll be discussing, as I mentioned, in the next episode of our podcast, episode number 39, so keep an eye out for that soon. Until then, it would mean the world to me if you guys could just leave a quick rating or review, a comment or like on whatever app of choice you're using to listen to this podcast. All of these things work wonders to really help the podcast grow, and which will, you know, help me continue to, uh, keep creating new episodes for you guys. And also don't forget to subscribe as well, just to make sure that you never miss an upcoming episode. If you have a buck or two to spare and would like to support the podcast and really all that I create for WellStoried monetarily, I do have a Patreon account as well. If you don't know, Patreon is a website that provides people an easy way to support their favorite creators via a, a monthly subscription. And that just begins as low as $1 a month. I've been a big fan of Patreon for a while and currently support several of my own favorite creators. If you guys would like to do the same for WellStoried, you can easily get involved over at patreon.com slash wellstoried. That's Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash wellstoried. <laughs> all right, friends, I think that's all I have for you today. Thank you for letting me give my little spiel as always, and thank you as well for listening in. I cannot wait to see you guys next time to discuss our third and final act of the three-act story structure. Until then, happy writing!